All right, so we're here in 2 Kings chapter 18. Tonight's just going to be more of a, a Bible study. Uh, we're just going to go through this whole chapter and see what we can pull out of this chapter. But there's going to be a common theme that I really want to focus on throughout this whole chapter. If you would, go to Psalm 118. Keep your finger there in 2 Kings 18, but go to Psalm 118. This is going to be the theme of this chapter over and over and over again. Psalm 118, verse 8. The Bible says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse 9. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So if you would, go back to 2 Kings chapter 18. So it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In man. This is a, a chapter that we're going to see over and over again how the faith of these men are going to be tried over and over, and how the world, pictured by Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, is going to try to attack your faith and try to attack you and try to prevent you from trusting in the Lord. See, Hezekiah here, he is a man of God. He is the king of Israel. He is a believer. He is doing well in the sight of the Lord. And he is going to picture the believer in this, in this uh, um, chapter. Sennacherib is the king of Assyria. And who is Assyria? It's just likened to the world. The unbelievers. So when we see all the parallels throughout this chapter, we're going to see how the world attacks the people of God. We'll start here in verse, uh, verse 1 in chapter 18. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and break the, the images and cut down the groves and br break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that him after, after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and he departed not from following him, but kept back his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. So we have Hezekiah, who was uh, the king, but he was under, um, you could say, a rule. He had to give a... a, um, a a monetary, uh, he had to give goods to the king of Assyria to basically because they were under their rule basically and to appease them and so that they would leave them alone and kind of just as long as you pay them money they're not really going to be messing with you but just to let you know you are under their authority because you are going to be paying them. So at this time, he's getting right with God. Ahaz just kind of ruined all Judah, and now he's coming in and fixing everything, right? He's breaking down the altars. He's um, uh, breaking down the, um, the serpent, which they turned from a good thing and started worshiping it and turned it into a bad thing. And so he noticed that, and he, uh, he got rid of that. But uh, we'll go back here in uh, verse 9. Uh, was it verse 9? Yeah, verse 9. And it came to pass in the fourth year of Hezek uh, King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Shalmezer, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years, they took it, even in the sixth year of Hezekiah, in the ninth year of Hoshea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel unto Assyria and put them in Hala and Habor by the river of Gozan in the cities of the Medes, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, but transgressed his covenant and all the Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and they would not hear them nor do, uh, nor do them. Now 13 is kind of where we get 
uh, jump into the uh, part of the chapter I really want to focus in from 13 all the way down. Now we get Sennacherib coming to Hezekiah. It says, Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. So here's the Assyrian king, and there's a bunch of fenced cities in, in uh, Judah, and he's already taken them out, one by one by one. I mean, Israel's already gone into captivity. He's just knocking them out. So he comes to them, and then in verse 14, And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. Return from me. That which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold. So this was the, the, uh, the money, the monetary uh, things that they were supposed to give him. And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. And at that time, Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars of the Hezekiah, and I'm sorry, and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan, Rab, Rabsar, Rabsaris, and Rabsheki from Lachish to King Hezekiah. So now we have him giving him uh, money, <coughs> but now Assyria is still coming after them to, up to Jerusalem. So he sends Tartan, he sends Tartan, Rabsaris, and Rabsheki. He sends his three ambassadors, if you will, to Jerusalem. It says, <clears throat> and with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. So here comes three of Assyrians, three of the Assyrians coming to Jerusalem, and then out comes the three <clears throat> people of God, the three uh, ambassadors of, of Hezekiah, basically. So we have three in a group, and then three, and then a whole multitude of people in the city and on the wall of the city. And Rabsheki, the person of Assyria, said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? So they're coming to him. They had paid him money, but now they're coming to him. And he's saying, Go tell your master, Hezekiah, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? He said, Why are you so confident in what, are, in what you're trusting in? You know, you seem to be so confident in what you're trusting in that you've disobeyed us. You've gone against us. What is so strong? What are you so confident in that as great of an army as of Assyria, you're not afraid to turn against them? What is that? He's coming to see what is worth turning against Assyria because Assyria is a great army. Verse 20, thou sayest, but they but are but in vain. So he's saying, you say, but they're vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? So he's saying, you say I have counsel and strength of war. And he says, whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? So he's saying, you say you have something to trust in. You say you have strength to, not, to go to war. Well, what are you trusting in? And then he's going to start attacking what they're trusting in. Verse 21. Now, behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh king of Egypt unto all that trust in him. So what is he saying? He says, lo, you trust in Egypt. He said, I know what it is. You're rebelling against Assyria because you're trusting in Egypt. And he says, well, you know what it's like when you trust in Egypt? He says, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt. So what he's saying? He's saying, 
it's a bruised reed. It's not very strong, right? And what is a reed? You can think of like reeds that grow on like the sides of rivers and stuff. You know, big straw, big grass. Kind of like a thicker weed, if you were, a thicker grass. But they're, they're not very strong. You know, with the, with the slightest wind, they'll be carried away or bent over. I, I, when I think of a bruised reed, I think of one that's like broken, like bent in half. It's bruised. It's not really going to be doing much. So he's saying what you're trusting in, what you're leaning upon is a bruised reed. He says, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So he's saying not only are you trusting in a bruised reed, which isn't very strong, but he's saying the thing that you're trusting in, it's like if you leaned on it, it would pierce your hand. He says it will go into his hand and pierce it. So it's just like this. If I'm trusting in something, if I'm trusting in this pulpit to hold me up, I'm leaning upon it, I'm putting my weight upon it, it can hold my weight. It's worth me putting my faith in it that it's going to hold me up. But he's saying when you put your faith in a bruised reed, he's saying not only is it not going to hold you, it's going to stick you back in the hand. Now what is that likening it unto? It's not strong enough to put all your weight onto it. What he's saying is when you put your trust in the king of Egypt, he's going to come back and pierce you in the hand. He's saying it's not, he's not a very trustworthy guy. It's not something you can, you can trust in. This is the king of Egypt we're talking about. You put all your faith in him to, to, to back you up, you're going to rely on him, and he's going to turn around and stab you in the hand. He's going to turn around and stab you in the back. Now, what do we get from this? One is that Pharaoh's a deceiver, and he can't hold uh, the truth. But this also teaches the world is teaching us that we can't trust the world. So, not, so the first thing I want to get at is here's Assyria picturing the world. Also, Egypt also pictures the world, but they're all representing the same thing. They're unbelievers, right? So the one thing the world can show us is that you can't trust the world. Right. He's coming and saying, hey, Judah, hey, man of God, you trust in Egypt, you can't trust Egypt. He's going to turn around and stab you. He's going to turn around and backstab you. You can't trust this world. You have one thing to trust on. It is better to put confidence in the Lord or to trust the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. God does not lie. See, men lie. You know, I could say something, I could fully rely that someone's going to do it, but if they say they're going to do it, they can lie and not do it. I mean, the king of Egypt can just take all their money, say, hey, we'll back you up, brother, and as soon as they need them, See ya. And he just stabbed him right in the hand. So one thing we know is that men lie. And one thing we know is God cannot lie. Right. So this is why we put our confidence and our trust in the Lord and not in men. Amen. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. It's not saying that God is not a man and saying not, that he can't be a man. He's saying he's not a man that he should lie. Right? A lot of Muslims try to use that and say, see, Jesus wasn't God. God is not a man. Yet God is a spirit, but he also became flesh. The world became flesh, but that's another topic. But what he's saying is, God is not a man that he should lie. You know why? Because men lie. That's what he's saying. He says, neither the Son of Man that he should repent. Right? So when God says something, he promises it, it's going to happen. We have confidence in what the Lord says because he can not lie. Men lie. Men repent. Men will say something and then repent and not do it. That's what he's saying. We cannot put confidence in man. We must put our confidence in the Lord. And in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We can put confidence because he cannot lie. Hebrews 6.18 says that by two immutable things in which it, is, it was impossible for God to lie. So one thing that the world can teach us, Assyria can teach us about Egypt, is that you can't trust them. You know, one thing I can trust about the, about the world is that I can trust that I can't trust them, right? I know for a fact that I can't trust them. I can trust that I can't trust them. Um, verse 22. But if ye say unto me, so this is the king of Assyria, 
But if ye say unto me, We trust in the Lord our God, it is not, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and has said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Now therefore, I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord and the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee two thousand horses, if thou be able on thy part to set on, to set riders, to set, Sorry, if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. So he, what he's saying is, he says, Now I pray thee, you know, give your pledges to the king of Assyria, and I will deliver you 2,000 horses. And what he's saying is, I'm going to give you 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. What is he doing? He's, he's, he's kind of putting it in their mind, hey, just... Relax. Just give us the money. I'll give you 2,000 horses. And guess what? You probably don't even have enough men to put on 2,000 horses. What he's kind of doing is stabbing them like, hey, you have no idea what you're going up against. I mean, this is a huge army. You don't even have enough riders for 2,000 horses. So he's trying to put into their mind, put into their doubt, you have nothing to stand on. I'll give you horses and you still can't come against us. Trying to put it, that little seed in their mind of doubt. Verse, uh, verse 23, no, verse 24, sorry. How then wilt thou turn away from the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for, horse, for chariots and for horses? So he's saying, how are you going to turn away one of the least of my Lord's captains, right? He's saying, I'm one of many captains of Assyria. I'm one of the least of the captains. He sent his least person to you with this huge army. And he'll give you 2,000 2, um, uh, horses. He says, how are you willing to turn from the great army of Assyria and to trust in Egypt for chariots and horsemen? So what is he saying? One thing that he's pointing out and, and the world is going to point out, and that's a good, it, what it's, it's a good thing that it's pointing it out, is not to put your trust in numbers. Not to put your trust in a horseman or in an army or depending on how many people are behind you or in, in some great movement. You know, basically your own strength, right? You know, it's easy to have confidence when you got a whole army behind you. It's easy to put confidence when you have men that are willing to stand up behind you. Or you have some movement that's going in the same direction you're going against. So you're willing to take that spear. You're willing to take that sword and go up against the Assyrian. But he's saying don't put confidence in how many horses and chariots uh, Egypt has. Now Proverbs 21.31 says this, The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Amen. We need to put all of our faith and our safety and our well-being in the Lord. Do not put your faith in numbers. Do not put your faith in how well things are going. Do not put your faith in the size of your church or the size of your bank account or you know, the size of you know, your, your own strength. The, the strength is of the Lord. And we need to be prepared against the day of battle. Yes, we should be prepared. We should have everything in order. But at the end of the day, we're not trusting Egypt and their numbers to help us out. You know, we are trusting solely in the Lord. We'll do everything it takes. Yeah, we build a wall because it's smart to build a wall. We don't want to just have an empty city, just a city with no wall and say the Lord will protect us. You know, it's, it's, it's you take the measurements you can and let the Lord do the rest. Yet the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but ultimately safety is of the Lord. And there's this thing called safety in numbers. It's actually like a thing that people study that you just, you genuinely feel safe when there's a lot of people going with you or going in the same way. You know, a lot of people have this feeling that there's, there's, there's less likely a bad thing to happen when you have a, 
sorry, not a bad thing to happen, a bad thing to happen to you when you're with a lot of people because it's just safety in numbers. What are the odds that if I'm in this huge you know, marathon or whatever, that something bad's gonna happen to me? And it's just something that generally humans have that, that feeling that there's safety in numbers. And although we might be doing great in our life and we have a lot of brethren and sister and sister and sisters behind us, never put your confidence in how many people are with you. When there's one person, yourself, always put your confidence in the Lord. Yeah. <clears throat> well, verse 25. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? So he's saying, he's proposing a question. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. So not only is he saying, you don't have enough men. Egypt's not going to help you. He's saying, the Lord, I came up here without the Lord. No, the Lord told me to destroy you. So what the world will try to do to, to weaken your confidence, to weaken your trust in the Lord, is to you know, make it confusing about what the Lord said. And what can we liken this to? What's confusing about what the Lord said today? All the Bible versions. Every uh, different Bible version that the, ha the, the, the world has today. What did the Lord say? I mean, is the Lord on our side? What did he say? Here's someone coming up and saying, you think you have the Lord. The Lord told me to come and destroy you. You know, what are they going to have against that? What do they have? What confidence that they have that the Lord didn't tell them that? Well, if they had the word of God, they would know for a fact that he was a liar. And the only way you can stand and have a foundation is knowing what the Lord said. We can liken this to the translations today. Probably one of the worst things you could do, personally, I think, is saying that the Lord said something when he didn't say it. I mean, that is extremely, extremely wicked. Just think about those connotations for a second. The words are probably the most, the most powerful thing in our world. And it's not something you can see, but it's something you can feel. The words are extremely powerful. I'll give you an example. I heard this once before. That, you know, <clears throat> there was a guy who, who gave this example. He said, if I had my mom, who I, who I wrote to, I hadn't wrote to in a long time. She, was a, she lives far away, and we used to write each other, and I haven't wrote to her in a long time. And then I wrote to her a, just a letter, and it said the most horrible things of, I just hate you, you're a horrible person, I never want to see you, it would be happy if I never, I would be happy if I never saw you again. You know, what kind of, what kind of reaction do you think that's going to get? I mean, even if it's not true, the words that she's receiving, the words that she's reading would just bring her to tears and just, uh, just devastate her, right? And then on the other hand, you could write her a note and say, I've been thinking about you every day. I felt so bad it's taken so long to write you. I miss you. I can't wait to see you. You're the best person I have. You know, what's that gonna, what's that gonna bear fruit of? It's gonna be a good tiding, right? It's gonna bring something forth good. And so it can cause extreme stress or it can cause extreme joy in one person, in one person's soul by simply just the words you say. And just by changing the words you can say, it can devastate somebody, or it, can, or it can make someone very happy and give them a lot of strength, a lot of faith. Well, when, you, when, when the Lord says something, what He says is where we can get our strength, and where we can get our um, confidence in. And w w when you say something, it, what, with the words that come in your mouth, right? The Bible says that the, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh, right? The mouth speaks what's in your heart. Well, if the Lord is speaking, He's speaking the mind of the Lord. You understand what He's thinking because He said it. You understand His heart, a man after His own heart. You know, you understand what He's saying. Well, the words that come out of your mouth, in a sense, are who you are, right? 
the words that I say in this sermon could be recorded somewhere. And if someone referred back to it, they would say, hey, Rick said that. And yes, I can confirm that I said that. And that is who he is. He's saying what he feels, what's in his heart. Well, if you said something horrible and it wasn't true, if I told you something extremely wicked that, hey, uh, Brother Hall, you know, Brother Bob said, you know, you, you're just the ugliest person in the world or something like that, right? You would think differently about what he said because, hey, I saw his heart. He told me something out of his heart, and now I know who he is. You know, the, if you say perverted things, people are going to think you're a perverted person. It's just, it's just based on the words you say. So the words are you, because I'm judging you based off what you say, right? And so when you, when you say something, I know who you are, and I can understand it. When the Lord says something, you know who he is, and you can understand it. And when, when you change what he says... Not only are you making it a lie, you're changing who he is. You're changing who he is. Because he said this. He said a good tiding, and he didn't say that. That's a wrong view of God. That's a wrong view. You know, Brother, Hall, Brother Bob's did not say that. But now that you look at him that way, it's a different Brother Hall than I see, right? So when all these Christians are reading all these other Bibles that say something else, it's a different person they're reading about. It's not the God that I'm reading about. The Holy Bible, the perfect Word of God, which is contained in the English language in the King James Bible. When I read this, it's holy words and I know who the Lord is. When you're reading words that He did not say, you have a different picture of who He is and that's not the Lord. It makes me extremely frustrated when people change what God said. And if the foundations, our foundation is the word, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So he tries to destroy the foundation by telling them what the Lord said. You know, if you would, turn to uh, Psalm chapter 12. Psalm chapter 12. The modern Bible versions do the same. They try to destroy the foundation and tell you, hey, no, the Lord told me to say this. Hey, no, the King James says that, but the Lord actually said this. Well, the Lord actually said this. They try to destroy your foundation. Psalm 12, verse 6, in the King James. Psalm 12, verse 6. Brother uh, Bobs, would you read Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7 out loud, please? The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth. Okay. So the words of the Lord are, sil are as silver in a furnace of earth purified seven times. So what are we talking about? The words of the Lord, right? Okay, go on. Verse 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Okay, so what are we talking about? The words. The words of the Lord. When he says, thou shalt keep them, the them is referring to the verse 6 before it. The words of the, Lord, of the Lord are pure words. Did you see any people mentioned before? I mean, after the words of the Lord were mentioned? No, right? So when it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, it's talking about the word of God. So my Bible says that God is going to keep His word. He's going to preserve His word. And not only is He going to preserve it, it's been purified seven times. It's incorruptible. It's as silver that's been purified. It's perfect. Amen. You don't need to change it. You don't need to come at me with another Bible verse or another version because you dug up something. He preserved it. It's that simple. Christians just need to understand, hey, 200 years ago, before you had the NIV, everyone was reading the King James Bible in the English language for the most part. The majority vast majority. I mean, no one's reading the Matthews Bible. No one's reading the Bishop's Bible. There's copies, but no one's done more work for the Lord in English than with the King James Bible. This Bible has saved more souls than the Matthews Bible could ever do, than the, than the Bishop's Bible could ever do, because it's been purified seven times. There's been six before. This is the seventh. It's purified. 
Well, the NIV took the liberty to do this in Psalm 12, verse 6. Look down at verse 6. This is what the NIV says. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Okay, similar, not the exact wording, but he's kind of saying the words are flawless and they're purified. Okay, verse 7. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked. Now, <laughs> verse 7 just told you that he will keep the needy and protect us forever from the wicked. Now, first of all, Amen, right? I mean, does the Lord keep the needy safe? He does, right? Amen. Does the Lord protect us that believe in, in Him, right, from the wicked? Yeah, He does. Amen. But is that what the Lord said? No. It's not what He said. He said, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Hey, I'm glad that the Lord keeps us safe. I'm glad that the Lord protects us from the wicked. But it's not what he said. He purified his word. I'm glad that because you, even though you changed the Bible to make it doctrinally sound, it's not what he said. It's a lie. Christians just need to get that in their mind. You know, I see people online and they're using different Bible versions. And, you know, it's, it's not, a, they're serving God. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, right? And you think, man, they just don't know. And you just try and show them, hey, look up this verse. And you'll actually find out it's not there. <laughs> right? A lot of times that's pretty eye-opening to people. But then you just get people that's just like, I'll just, someone will make a quote, quote a verse. And I say, well, that's actually saying something different than what the King James, King James says. Let me quote you this one. It says, the Bible says this. I say, I ask a question, what did he say? And they say, well, he said both. And it's just like, you just want to grab people and shake them. It's just like, hey, you know what? I don't care if what your Bible says, it's true that he keeps them. It's not what he said. It's a lie. You have a different God. You have a different view of what he said. So when... Uh, when the king of Assyria comes and he says, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it, we later find out that he is lying. He's just trying to cause doubt in their mind that the Lord is on their side, that they have the authority. I have the authority. I know what God actually says. And so the world today, the unbelieving world is going to tell you, hey, we know what God actually said. We actually have the newer Bible. We know what he says. The Lord is actually on our side because he said thus. He said this. They have a false God. They have a false Bible version. The world will try to destroy your foundation by attacking the word of God and say that they are the authority of God's word. <clears throat> verse, uh, verse, let's go to verse 26. Spend a good time on that. Verse 26. Then said Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, unto Rabshaki, speak, I pray thee, to thy servants in the Syrian language, and for we understand it. And talk not with us in the Jews' language in the ears of the people that are on the wall. So, I mean, we have, um, we have the Eliakim, the guy who is for Hezekiah, the good guy. He's talking to the bad guys, and he's saying, hey, hey, whoa, talk to us in the Assyrian language. You're around a lot of Jews right now. Don't talk in the Jews' language. We speak Assyrian, talk in the Assyrian language. We'll understand you. And it's, it's actually a smart maneuver because what he's bringing is a damnable message. And that's the point of what he's bringing. You'll read right here. In uh, 27, it says, but... Rabshaki said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall? So he's saying, the reason why I came to you, has, has my master not sent me to your master and to you and to the people on the wall? He's like, no, I'm got, I came to speak to them. 
This is, I'm going to talk to them in their language. He says, what is the message? That they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss? What I think he's saying is, well, I mean, what he's doing is he's threatening them with the worst possible situation. Because what they do is they besiege cities, right? And they're already come to the, the entry of the city where, um, what did it say? Uh, ch -ch -ch. The, and, and they came in verse 17, and you don't have to go there. It says, and they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. So they came to the conduit of this city, you know, a major probably uh, highway to bring goods into the city. Well, they're going to besiege it. They're going to stop that from happening. If you read other uh, chapters in the Bible, when they besiege a city, you stop everything from going in and you stop everything from coming out. And sooner or later, that city decays and gets worse and worse and worse until they have to forfeit. And you remember those, the time when the, uh, the ladies had to eat their own children. And they're talking about boiling, killing a child and then having the, the boy, the, the, the other child, the next night, right? And they're fighting over it. Well, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a hard thing to swallow, right? Eating children. It's a hard thing to talk about you know, eating gun and drinking pits. It's not a polite subject. It is the Word of God. God did record it, but was it God talking? I mean, it, what I'm saying is, it's, it's, it's the world that talks like that. You know, the world is going to say stuff like that. We ought not to be talking like, you know, like that. Now, it's recorded, and it, it is true that they said that, but there are also things that we should not be, you know, going around and just, you know, that, that we also, we shouldn't have um, the... Our, our, our speech should be seasoned with salt, basically. You know, we ought not to just be getting down to, you know, I mean, when it has to, when it has to come to it, you need to, you need to say it straight. But, I mean, um, notice that usually the perverted talk is of the world. You know, the world that's going to say, you know, dark things, things of that nature. But that's not my point. Well, the point is that when I'm through with you, you're not going to have anything to eat. You're not going to have anything to drink because nothing's coming in and nothing's going out of this city. 28 says, Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the what? In the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king Assyria. So he's saying, Hey, I'm not going to talk in the Assyrian language. I'm going to put fear in the hearts of men and continue to talk in the Jews' language because that's the reason why I came and I want them to hear this message. They want to hear this, this damnable message that they're going to be damned, basically, that they're doomed and cause fear in their heart. Uh, <clears throat> now, verse 30. Oh, sorry, where did I, is that where I stopped? 29. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Saying, don't let Hezekiah deceive you, that you're going to be uh, delivered out of Sennacherib's hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not deli be delivered into the hand of uh, and not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now what we read here is that he's saying, don't let Hezekiah, you know, the man of God, the, the, the king of Israel, the king of Judah, make you trust in the Lord. Now we need Hezekiahs today, and one thing that we can learn from this verse is that it's a, it's a good man of God that tells you to trust in the Lord. Right now, there's a lot of men who play priest. You know, they get up and preach, but then they play priest and say that ultimately, you know, I need to decide how you interpret that, or I need to decide, you know, the interpretation. And if you don't understand that interpretation or agree with that interpretation, you know, you're not saved or you're a reprobate or whatever. There's people that try to control you and say, I'm the authority, and not turn you to the Lord. See, it's the Hezekiahs, it's the men of God that are going to make you trust in the Lord. Don't trust me. I'm a man. Trust in the Lord. I can do you wrong. The Lord cannot do you wrong. 
Verse 30, neither let Hezekiah let you trust in the Lord. You know, a good man is going to tell people to trust in the Lord. Good men can also admit when they're wrong. You know, a good man is going to get up and say, hey, you know what? I preached that. I preached it hard. I thought I was right. I thought I was on the Lord's side. Turns out I was wrong. You know what? Because the Lord is always right. If ever something that I preached that turned out the Lord to be right, I'm wrong. He's right. The, what the Bible says is right. So the good man of God is going to say, don't trust me, trust in the Lord. And then when the good man of God realizes he's wrong, he's going to say, I was wrong. Trust in the Lord because I am wrong. But you know, good men, good, godly, wholesome men that love the Lord, serve God, read their Bible, can still, still steer you wrong. You know, that's one thing I like about the Bible is reading all these great heroes of the faith, the great apostles, the prophets, the kings, the, the priests, the, the, all the great men of God that have done great things for God. There's one thing that makes us all brethren, other than you know, faith in the Lord. We're all sinners. And that's one thing that you can you know, have comfort in is, you know what? Every man you read about that does good also does wrong. He's also a sinner. It's comforting to know that. Good men of God do wrong. No man of God is going to be perfect. I could do you wrong someday. I hope to God I never do. You could do me wrong. Pastor is a man. And I hope to God he never does anyone wrong. But he's a man. He could do someone wrong. But the Lord will never do you wrong. Right? The good man of God is going to teach you to trust in the Lord. You know, Paul, who did he... Remember the Apostle Paul? Remember he steered someone wrong? He steered Timothy wrong. What did he do? He had him circumcised, right? Great man of God, the Apostle Paul, steered someone wrong. He told him to do something that was wrong. It's not past anyone that they can steer you wrong. We need to be conscious of that and know that, that this man, he's a great man of God. I look up to him, but he can steer me wrong. Always trust in the Lord. Not only Paul, you think about Peter. Think about it, when Peter was taken away in Galatians 2 with all the Jews, right? When the people of James came, you know who he steered wrong? Barnabas. It says that Barnabas was also taken away. So because of him being a great man of God, he got into wrong and he steered Barnabas to do wrong also. No man of God is perfect. They can all steer you wrong, but the Lord will never steer you wrong. Hezekiahs are going to be men of God that make you trust in the Lord. Verse 31. <clears throat> Actually, let me, let me hark on that for a bit, just, just so I could get back. You know, saying that men will never let you wrong. Men, men, the good men of God can, can steer you wrong. All in all, then, you know, the Apostle Paul says, you know, follow me as I follow Christ. You know, we need to have someone to follow, but not follow them into sin, right? You know, we all have children, uh, girls and boys, and we all want to steer them right. And girls and boys, listen, you listen to your mother and your father. You obey them, and they are going to try to do what's right for you, Right? They are going to want to do what's right for you. But, you know, I, I always hearken on my children to, I command them, you know, to read the Bible, right? I want them to know and fear the Lord, to know the Lord. You know, and the Bible says in 2 John uh, 4, it says, I greatly rejoice that I found in thy children walking in truth, right? There's great joy knowing that your children walk in truth, but... You know, great men of God leading their children, it's, I'm sure everyone thinks about this from time to time. I want to raise my children for the Lord so bad, but I don't want them to serve the Lord just because of me. Just because dad told them to. Just because that's what they were born into. That's because that's what mom and dad does. Mom and dad goes to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You know, I don't want my children to serve the Lord because 
we told them to. They serve the Lord, yes, because we commanded them to read the Bible, but ultimately we want them to want to serve the Lord. Amen? We want them to serve God out of their own heart, out of their own volition. I would hate for them to resent the things of God because someone forced it on them. I want them to taste the, the grace of God. The grace of God is what's going to make you follow the Lord. The fear of the Lord is what's going to make you follow the Lord. You fear the Lord. You understand His grace. The grace, once you realize you're completely forgiven for no work at all. I mean, I find it hard that I, 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 I find it hard that I wouldn't serve the Lord just because grace alone. Just the fact that you're, you're forgiven. You know, but Deuteronomy 6, it is a commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might. It's a commandment to love the Lord with all your heart. But there comes a point where you have to decide, you know what? I'm going to serve the Lord because I want to. You know, that's the point. That's where we all want our children to be is to reach that point that you are serving the Lord because you want to. You are reading because you want to. You fear the Lord. You are going soul winning because you love the lost. You want to go soul winning. I mean, kids, some like going soul winning and some you have to drag along with you, right? But you do it because you ultimately want them to love to do it. They want to love to serve the Lord. Let's get back on um, verse, uh, what was it, verse 31. And then King Hezekiah, or um, uh, uh, Sennacherib says, Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me, buy a present, and come out to me, and then eat every man his own vine, and every man, everyone his own fig tree. And, er and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and die not, and not die, and hearken not unto Hezekiah, when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. <clears throat> so one thing we can get here, he's saying, I'm going to give you all these things. You know, it's, it's, it's really easy. Well, one, when you're being attacked, it's really hard when you're just being attacked with, you know, you know things that are going to physically harm you, right? Physical harm, harm you, physically harm your family, your well-being, your, your lands, your, your income, your, your house, your, 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 your way of life, your, your work. But, you know, he's, I mean, he's really working every angle. I mean, he's saying, you can't outmatch us. We got so many numbers. The Lord is on our side. Actually, the Lord told us this. You know, you can't, you can't fight against us. Now he's attacking him and saying, you know, don't let um, um, Hezekiah tell you that the Lord is going to save you. He says, I'll give you all this if you come over. And, say, and it's really tempting to want to go to the world when, it, when they offer you all the same things, they say, hey, you know what? You can stop. You can just give up right now. No one will be hurt. Your family will be fine. You'll actually have land. You'll have corn. You'll have wine. It's a lot easier to want to maybe consider that option, right? I don't have to fight. No one has to die. And I'm actually even going to get something out of it. I mean, he's attacking them on every angle. I mean, think of the world, how they do that to you and say, come over on our side. You can, have, you can have the money. You can have the home. You can have the life without the persecution. I mean, we all have persecution, some more than others. But I mean, is the world being persecuted? No, right? I mean, there's no persecution. It's all uh, olive oil and honey over there. And so he's tempting them with that. But also we can say, we're, we can see that he says... Hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. You know, men will tell you to trust uh, them for salvation and to trust yourselves. But the Hezekiah is going to say that the Lord will deliver us. You know, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the Lord, or the Catholic, let's say this, the Catholic Church is going to tell you that 
you need to trust in man. You need to put your confidence in man. You know, the, the Bible says to put your trust in the Lord. Put your confidence in the Lord when it comes to salvation. Do you put your confidence in man? Are you trusting in the Lord? Or are you putting your confidence in man? <clears throat> the Catholic Church teaches that in order to forgive sins, you have to confess them to a priest. I mean, that's the epitome of putting confidence in man. That's why, that's why they use interchangeable. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's, it's saying the same thing. Trust and confidence are the same thing. When you confide in something, you're trusting in that. Confidence is just like a stronger word of trust that not only do you trust, but you believe it's going to come to pass. You believe. So therefore, you're strong in your faith. You're strong in your trust. But it's, it's saying... Not put to, um, the Catholic Church teaches that you must trust a priest to give you the, the right amount of prayers in order to have your sins forgiven. You must eat the bread and drink the wine every Sunday. You must be baptized. These are all ways that you trust in man to get to heaven. That's what the false gospel, the false religion of this world is, is saying trust in man and not the Lord. Catholic Church teaches a priest must absolve your sins. Muslims teach that you must follow the teachings of Muhammad and do his teachings and pray five times a day, right? And do good works. They say that, well, if I do enough good works, that'll outweigh all my bad works and therefore I'll go to heaven. And I actually, I remember giving a gospel to a, a, a Muslim woman one time and she said, I'm going to heaven 100% by faith. And it was like, it really took me back because I'm like, I'm like battling with this lady. So I'm like, no, you're actually not. She's like, yeah, I actually am. She's just like, I'm putting all my faith that God is just going to forgive my sins when I die. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> okay, like I hadn't been saved all that long. I was actually soul winning with Pastor Baker. This was years ago in Tempe. It was right by my house. And she's like, I'm putting all my faith that God is just going to forgive my sin. Just outweigh my bad with my good and just forgive my sin. Well, you have a problem with that. Number one, your God is not a just God. Your God lets all this wrongdoing go unpunished, which is a wicked God. You know, a, a, even a worldly judge. If you do a bunch of bad and a bunch of good, he still has to punish the bad because he's a good judge. If your God weighs your good and weighs your bad and says you did more good, forget about the bad, you have a wicked God. He's an unjust God. But not only that, let's just say God did that, which he doesn't. But let's just say God, let's just say it was a fact that God weighs your good versus your bad. What you're deciding then or what you're trusting in is yourself to do more good works than bad works. It's the same thing. The world's salvation is different than the salvation of the Lord. Salvation of the Lord is He did everything. All my, all my uh, uh, faith is in the Lord. The death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And all my faith is on Him and Him alone for what He did. So the salvation of the world is trust everything else. Trust in your baptism. Trust in your repentance. Trust in your priest, your church, your religion that you grew up in. Trust in anything else other than the Lord. Trust that your works will outweigh your bad. It's, it's like that through every, every uh, denomination. You know, the Church of Christ teaches you have to be baptized to be saved. It just goes on and on. Psalm 18.2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My buckler, the horn of my salvation, my high tower. I mean, that's someone that you can trust in. That's someone that there's safety in. He's a buckler. He's a rock. He's a fortress, a deliverer, my strength, my salvation, my high tower. That's the, the God that we serve, and that's the God that we can trust. Proverbs 14.26 says, In the fear of the Lord, 
is strong confidence. Why? And his children shall have a place of refuge. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge, shall be safe. All right, well, let's uh, read verse 33, and we'll go on down and we'll finish the rest. Verse 33, Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all in this land and out of the hand of the king of Assyria? So what is he doing? He's putting doubt, not only that God is on their side, but now he's saying, Who is your God? Has any of the gods of the, of the nations that delivered, um, have any of the gods of the nations delivered them out of my hand? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim and Hena and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. So he's saying, have all these nations, have their God delivered them? This is like, who are they? I mean, these are great nations, and their God couldn't even protect them. He says, who is the Lord? He says, uh, who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? Who's, who's the Lord? But the people held their peace and answered him not a word for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household of Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, and the son of Asaph, the recorder, the, and Hezekiah with their clothes, and rent, and told him the words of Rabshakeh. I wish I could go on to the second chapter. It's just an awesome chapter. But, I mean, they end up going to um, Isaiah, the prophet, and getting the word of God. Because what did they do? They made them doubt the word of God. I mean, they hadn't got the word of God, but they were still trusting in the Lord. They were saying, hey, don't let Hezekiah tell you to trust in the Lord. They hadn't had a word from the Lord saying that they were going to be delivered. Right? So he said, answer them not. And then they go and get the word of the Lord, and what happens? They find confidence. They find confidence. God fights for them. But what I wanted to point out is he's mocking the God of the Bible. He's mocking the Lord. He's saying, who is the Lord all these other gods didn't deliver them. When I come up against you, you think the Lord's going to stop me? He's mocking God. Now that's exactly what the world likes to do. I like to look at the God of the Bible and say he's just like all the other gods. Just like the God of Muhammad and the, the God of Buddhism and the God of, you know, whatever. He's just like any other God. Who is he? Who is he? He's not going to deliver you. They try to cause doubt in our God. But our God is not as their gods, the Bible says. Our God is not as their God. Our God is alive. Their God is dead. All the other nations, their God was dead. Ours was alive. Their gods... Look, actually, what? Turn to Psalm 115. We'll end there. Psalm 115. There's a difference between the Lord and the gods of Hena, the gods of Arpad, the god of Sepharvaim and Iva and, Samir, and, uh, and um, Hama, or Hema. Psalm 115, verse 3, it says this, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is everyone that trusteth in them. What is he saying? Our God is in the heavens. Our God is alive. Their God is dead. Their God is not alive. Their God has eyes that cannot see, ears that cannot hear, a throat that cannot speak. Their God and the God of all the other gods of the lands, you know what they are? 
They're gods that men made up. Men made up gods. But the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord, is the true God. The Bible says He's the true God. He will show one day who is the true God, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the only potentate. He'll show all the mockers one day who is the Lord. And He's going to show what's the difference between our God, the rock, the refuge, the high tower we have, and the difference with all theirs. Theirs are made with hands. Our God made the hands that made their gods. Our God made the eyes that they worship their gods with. Our God gave them breath that they pray to their false god. Our God is the creator. Our God gave them the ability to use their hands and they with their hands made their own God after the image that they want. And that's what you see throughout this whole world is a bunch of idolatry. And it, it's, it's a false God. It's, it's not of the Bible. All the other gods of this world are not like the true God. They want to mock. The unbelievers want to mock. Say the Lord is just like all the other gods. Our God is alive. Our God is the God of the living. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's going to show one day the difference between all the other gods. And theirs are made with hands. Theirs are, are corruptible. Theirs are going to fade away and pass through the fire and be burnt up. As well as they. But our God will shine bright, you know, forever and ever. He is going to be our rock and our refuge. He's going to be our governor. Um, and we're going to dwell with him forever. But we can see in this chapter a lot of ways that the king of Assyria, a lot of ways that the world is going to try to attack your faith in the Lord. It's going to try to attack your faith in the Lord. But it is always better to put confidence, to trust the Lord, than to put confidence in man. Let's bow and pray. Lord, I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Lord, I pray for the um, pastor that he would get to his destination safely. That you be with us on our travels also. That you be with this whole church in this time, Lord. And help us realize that uh, you know, this week we, we celebrate with family and friends to give honor and thanks to you and what you have done and all the blessings we have received and what we are to receive by inheritance through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done. And bless the singing in tonight's service. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.